Hello everyone and welcome to Teach Me in 10, the video series brought to you by Technology Networks, where we ask scientists to describe their research areas or a scientific concept in less than 10 minutes. My name is Rihanna Lilly-Smith and I'm a junior science editor for Technology Networks. Our guest for this video interview is Rosie Young, a doctoral candidate at the Quadrum Institute Bioscience. Rosie is from the Carding Research Group on a project centred around the effect of stresses on human performance as mediated by changes in the gut microbiome. Rosie is going to teach us what is the microbiome and how do we study it in just 10 minutes. Hi, uh, thank you for the introduction. So yeah, as mentioned, I am Rosie. I am a PhD candidate at Quadrum Institute Biosciences. And hopefully by the end of this Teach Me in 10, you'll know a little bit more about what the gut microbiome is and how we study it. So what is the gut microbiome? If we were to break it down really simply, micro meaning small, biome being a community of abiotic, which is non-living and biotic living components. So put that together and we've got a community of organisms, typically viruses, bacteria and fungi, and their surrounding products and genetic material on a small scale within the gut. Now, believe it or not, the human body is actually home to 38 trillion microbial cells. The reason we're so interested in the gut microbiome is because that is where we find most of them residing. What is the purpose of the gut microbiome? So we have quite a good relationship with it in the fact that we give our microbes somewhere nice to live and we give them food. And in response, they feed us with nutrients, vitamins, and they protect us against pathogens. How they do this is they break down foods that we can't break down naturally, things like fibres and plant materials, but also they can synthesise vitamins and other compounds which are useful for our health. This means we can reabsorb them through the gut lining into the blood and make use of them. They can protect us against pathogens getting established in our gut. So we have things called commensal bacteria, which is the harmless bacteria that just sits in the gut and does its job and helps keeps us healthy. By taking up space on the gut lining, this means that pathogenic bacteria is unable to get established. Commensal bacteria also keeps the gut lining healthy, which is super important because the gut lining is responsible for controlling what gets in from our gut into the rest of our body and our bloodstream. Now, when we see a shift in the community structure, this can sometimes allow pathogenic bacteria the opportunity they need to get established. And it can lead to the gut lining not functioning optimally, meaning that products we wouldn't normally want to get into our bloodstream can. Essentially, the gut lining can become more leaky and more permeable, something called leaky gut. Now, the reason we don't want this happening is because when something gets into our bloodstream that shouldn't really be there, this can trigger the immune response and cause things like inflammation. Because the gut has a vast neurological and vascular network, it means it has really good connections to other parts and systems of the body. So when we get a release of these inflammatory markers, they can travel to other parts of the body and may cause low-level inflammation at other sites, which can lead to the onset of lots of different conditions, as highlighted in the diagram. In terms of what affects our gut microbiome, a better question might be what doesn't. Almost everything can affect our gut microbiome to the point that it's almost as unique as your fingerprint. You would only share 10 to 20% of the genes that are held in your gut microbiome with another person. That means 80% is completely unique to you. It can be affected by things like stress, exercise, diet, even the way that you were born, whether it was C-section or natural. And just to highlight how different lifestyles can impact your gut microbiome, I included this image, which was taken from Rosas Plaza et al. So as you can see, this is highlighting the different types of bacteria that we have present within our gut. And it's based on different lifestyles, things like hunter-gatherers, agricultural, urban. And hopefully you can just see from a snapshot that it's very, very different depending on the type of lifestyle you lead. That's what makes it so interesting to study. So when we look to study the gut microbiome, we're typically interested in two main questions. The first one is what does it actually look like? So what's actually present in our gut microbiome and in what amounts? And the second one is what is it actually doing? To start answering these questions, the best way we have is to take a stool sample, which offers a kind of snapshot of the types of microbes that you have in your colon. 
we do DNA extraction and then submit for next generation sequencing. So this can be 16S sequencing if you're just interested in bacteria. Or what is a lot more common now is whole genome sequencing, which takes all of the genetic material present and gives us a more comprehensive view of the types of viruses, fungi and bacteria present. Once we've got our data output, we can plug it into bioinformatic pipelines and generate several outputs. One of them is relative abundance, meaning that we look at how much of different types of microbes do we have present in relation to other parts of the community. So what species and what genera are most dominant in that community? We can also look at alpha diversity and beta diversity. So these are metrics which look at how diverse our gut microbiome is. The reason we're interested in this is because how diverse your gut microbiome is could tell you a thing or two about your health. More diverse guts tend to be associated with better health states. And there's also growing evidence that certain types of genera may be linked to better health outcomes. We're also super interested in what the microbes in our gut are doing. This is because they have 100 times plus more genes than the human genome. So that is a whole range of possibilities of what they could actually be doing. Around 50% of these genes could be linked to specialist functions which are unique to each individual. So there is a whole lot of complexity there to unwrap. Now, one of the ways that we can look at what they're actually doing is functional analysis. So we would take the data that I talked about on the last slide, run it through some algorithms, and based on the genes present, we can get an idea of what kind of functions it's performing in the gut. There are also other omic technologies, things like transcriptomics, proteomics and metabolomics. Now, each of these are designed to understand not just what genes are present, but which ones are actually switched on and being expressed. Because just because a gene is present, it doesn't mean it's actively being used and transcribed. So these allow us to get a little bit more information about the kind of active metabolic pathways and products being produced. We do also have ex vivo models, so things like organ on a chip, which is where we can artificially recreate a gut microbe or blood interface and understand what happens when we add certain bacteria or certain products to that environment. Because the gut microbiome is impacted by so many variables like I talked about, this can be really useful if we're trying to understand specific mechanisms in a more controlled environment. We do also have animal models. Typically, we would work with germ-free mice. This is where they have a sterile gut microbiome, meaning that there is no bacteria there. And then we can add the types of compositions that we want and measure outcomes on health. Because of the complexity of microbiome interactions, it's a quite a good idea to combine multiple methods to try and get as comprehensive view as possible. There is still a lot we don't know, and it's really hard to establish causality. But hopefully with growing technology, we'll learn more and more. Thank you for watching the video, and I hope that that's given you a bit more information on what the gut microbiome is and how we can look at studying it. Thank you to Rosie for joining us here at Teach Me in 10. If you'd like to know more about the microbiome, make sure you check out the resources linked in the video description. Stay tuned for the next instalment of Teach Me in 10. Bye!